This is Global Order. I'm Hindul Sen Gupta. I'm really happy and privileged that Rear Admiral Mukul Asthana has joined me in conversation today. Uh, Admiral Mukul Asthana has had a really distinguished career in the Indian Navy, including, of course, serving as Assistant Chief of Naval Staff. Uh, for the Indian Navy. Uh, he's really an expert in many of the issues that are formulating our headlines these days. And I requested Admiral Astana to join me in this conversation, conversation so that we could tackle some of those issues. Admiral, thank you very much for your time. Indol, good morning to you. Wish you a belated happy Independence Day and uh, very good morning. I must say that I feel quite privileged and honored to be talking to you. Being on your show. A very good morning to you, Admiral. The honor is all mine and belated happy Independence Day to you too. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I want to begin, sir, by asking you a question that many people are asking. For many years, we have spoken about China's so-called Malacca dilemma, the dilemma that a large, overwhelmingly large amount of its trade goes through the narrow Malacca Straits, which either the US or India, China fears, could at some point block to hurt China in any conflict situation. Now, many people are asking, uh, China's naval projection, power projection in the Bay of Bengal, in a sense, is it, a, is it, a, a, is it an effort to, uh, in some senses, balance its Malacca dilemma? Yes, I think uh, you're asking a very pertinent question, Hindol. Uh, as you are aware, and your audiences uh, may be aware too, that Malacca Straits is uh, uh, one of the choke points we have in the Indian Ocean region. It's a long, narrow strait uh, which passes through the countries of uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and some smaller nations. And uh, not only the waters are narrow, they are treacherous. Uh, much of the world trade passes uh, through these Balaka Straits because they shorten the distance between uh, the Pacific, South China Sea, Indian Ocean region and onward to the Mediterranean and Europe or uh, via the Cape of Good Hope that is south of Africa onto the Atlantic side. So uh, it is important to uh, realize that almost 80% of uh, oil and energy needs of China uh, they flow through the Malacca Straits. And uh, that's what makes this uh, strait very vulnerable for Chinese trade in case uh, uh, somebody wishes to uh, stock their cargo or uh, blockade or uh, worse still, if they uh, mine these blocks. Now, there are alternative uh, routes available like the Lombok Strait and Sunda Strait, uh, which are a little longer for the trade to flow through. But even those can be uh, blockaded and mined and the cargo stopped. So this remains a big dilemma for China, which uh, with uh, such a large population, such a large landmass requires a large amount of oil and energy for it to sustain. And you know, it's one of the foremost economies today in the world. Talk a little bit about its power projection in Bay of Bengal then. Um, what do you make of China's naval power projection in the Bay of Bengal? So, um, China is trying a multi-pronged strategy to mitigate their uh, vulnerabilities of uh, getting any kind of a blockading of the cargo, their trade, their energy requirements. One, of course, uh, we can touch upon this a little later, is their uh, Belt and Road initiatives. But uh, along the seas, uh, which are the traditional uh, trading routes, they have, over the years, brought in a large amount of uh, naval force in the Indian Ocean region. I remember correctly that it was in 2008, almost 16 years ago, when the first of the Chinese uh, naval forces appeared in the Indian Ocean region through the Malacca Straits. And they proceeded towards the Red, uh, the, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, to, uh, to help mitigate uh, the piracy threat in that area. The world thought that they have come for a short time. 
but uh, I must say that they have, ever since the last 16 years, they have always maintained at least three to four ship presence in that area. The ships are uh, relieved on task and uh, the older ones which have uh, stayed there for about six, seven months, they go back to the mainland. At times, their submarines also accompany these uh, waters. That besides, uh, China has uh, also deployed their uh, fishing vessels, what they have, the militia fishing vessels, which carry out uh, research in the Indian Ocean region for uh, looking for uh, fish-rich uh, areas, uh, which can take care of their uh, food requirements in the mainland. And uh, it's very well known around the world that many of these fishing vessels are also carrying out uh, uh, activities uh, which will uh, research activities which will help their military to gain more knowledge and information. Thirdly, and which is more worrying for our country, is that uh, um, their policy of trying to encircle India uh, according to their old traditional Chinese game called Waiki, uh, they follow that strategy very well even today. They and the so called string of pearls. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they have created a string of pearls around India to encircle India, to prevent India to project its power and to contain it. That's what their endeavor is. And according to this, what they've done is they have developed a base in Djibouti in the Gulf of Aden. They have uh, their presence in Seychelles. They are trying to develop uh, their port in Seychelles. Uh, they also have uh, presence in uh, Gwadar, having developed the port for Pakistan. And uh, closer home uh, in Hambantota in Sri Lanka. And uh, now the endeavors are to also uh, develop and operate the port of uh, uh, Kakpu, which I think is pronounced as Chow Chu in the Mandarin. This is uh, a little northwest of uh, Yangon. And uh, their aim is to also start uh, the overland trade between China through Bay of Bengal, uh, between Kunming and uh, Chakchu, and as well as uh, from the Sinkiang region across Karakoram to the Gwadar. So I'm very sure that uh, the people uh, who are in the know and they keep a track of these things, they are fully aware of uh, what China is up to. And uh, these are some of the measures that they have taken up. Well, I'm really glad you brought up Chapchu because that comes to the next part of my question to you. Uh, there was a, there has been a lot of speculation that China is trying to balance its sort of maritime vulnerability by opening a multiple, as you said, land routes, including through its Belt and Road Initiative. Now, two key land routes that directly impact India, of course, is the one that you just mentioned, which starts, I think, in Kuming in China and comes straight to Chapchu in, of course, Myanmar. Uh, the other, of course, starts in Xinjiang and goes all the way, like you said, crosses the Karakoram and goes all the way to Gwadar. Now, both of these two are part of, one is part of the China-Pakistan economic uh, corridor, the other is part of the China-Myanmar economic corridor. Now, I want to ask you, both of these two things, though, are in lots of trouble. In the China-Pakistan economic corridor, Balochistan is up again in arms. Lots of Chinese people have been attacked there. Many have been killed by rebels. Uh, you know, a lot of money. There's a lot of misappropriation of funds. And there's a sense that China is unwilling to put more money in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. In fact, that was Pakistan's great hope that this will lift up its economy, but that doesn't seem to be happening, at least at the moment. In Myanmar, there's a raging civil war, Admiral, and where you know reports suggest that China is playing both sides, the junta and the rebels, and yet even there, their dream of effectively very peacefully connecting uh, Kumin to Chapchu, again, question mark. In your assessment, where do both these two projects stand, sir? I think a uh, very, very apt question, you know, I must say, and uh, because this really impacts India from both the sides, from the east as well as the west. Talking about the west, uh, the Gwadar port is fully developed, and uh, their connectivity with the 
Xinjiang district of China is more or less completed. Unfortunately, as you alluded, as you alluded to uh, some of the setbacks, the CPEC, uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor has suffered along this uh, highway is because of the uh, activities of uh, the militants and terrorists, which has uh, caused China to take a pause and relook as to whether they really want to go ahead or not. Well, the this road also passes through the Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which is claimed by India. So India also has raised the red flag on that. And uh, as of now, as things stand, uh, we will uh, really need to watch very carefully as to how CPEC progresses. But uh, uh, let's have no doubts with the, the kind of perseverance China has shown. I'm sure they will be able to find, uh, uh, you know, some inroads into developing this further. Coming to the China-Myanmar uh, economic corridor, which will join their uh, Kunming, which is in the Yunnan district, to uh, Chukchu in uh, Myanmar. Uh, this, this road will pass through Mandalay, and which also is along the old Burma road, which the British had. And uh, I have been privileged to see part of these roads which the China has developed in Myanmar during one of my visits. And uh, I must say that roads are made very, very carefully with a lot of uh, future thought. They are six to eight lane roads with, and in, in places they don't even have a median in between, no divider. Obviously, they are meant to operate uh, some of the fighter aircraft from the road. Now, uh, whilst uh, we may uh, discuss further the, the progress and uh, the expected progress completion of this project. What has been seen around is that uh, China uh, has had a very uh, complex and multifaceted role in uh, what is going on in Myanmar. Uh, they have good relationship with the military uh, as well as uh, the elected government. And... Uh, on the other hand, they, there, is also, there are also allegations that they may have helped uh, the militants, especially in their uh, troubled uh, regions and districts, which has not gone down well with the uh, military junta or the electric government for that matter. So this remains a very kind of a very complex situation out there. But uh, uh, all indicators are that uh, the Myanmaris will finally lean towards China and uh, let this port develop. Therefore, one must come to the next question, which is if both of these things, because of China's resourcefulness and guile, or just simple perseverance and material strength comes to pass, what will India's situation be and how can India respond to both of these things, which will certainly be a threat to India? Yes. Uh, so, whilst uh, the the United Nations uh, Conventions on Laws of the Seas allow every and any nation to operate in the international waters, and uh, it would be well within uh, Chinese rights to operate uh, their trade either from Gwadar on the west or from Chokchu later uh, along the east, what would happen is that this will also bring in more of their naval ships submarines and perhaps uh, long distance aircraft which will keep a vigil over the area to keep their uh, sea lines of communications clear and open and uh, that would also be uh, uh, a threat or a cause of concern to say the least for uh, other literal nations and uh, India is the foremost uh, stakeholder in this place and uh, the cause of uh, India's stand of being the net security provider in the Indian Ocean region, we look after the search and rescue in the entire IOR uh, up to 30 degrees uh, south latitude. This also is incumbent on us to see that our, our ships move freely, our aircraft operate freely away. Uh, that's why the necessity and need to develop uh, our Navy further, our naval infrastructure further, especially in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and to enhance the naval capabilities in terms of uh, the ships submarines, aircraft, as well as the firepower. And have you spoke about um, the, uh, the need to expand our naval capacity? Because this is a question even the Americans are asking. 
Admiral China is building warships at a pace and naval capability at a pace never seen before in human history. Uh, some assessments suggest that they are, in a sense, building a whole new sort of capacity of the Indian naval forces each year as they develop. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is a pace even America cannot match. How do you think countries like India and indeed America could respond to this kind of expansion? So, uh, America has always had uh, very global aspirations. And uh, they are now being challenged by the rising China. They have global aspirations and hence the need to have a very large, expanded, capable fleet. India has uh, a very regional outlook. We look at Indian Ocean region. We don't want to fight. We don't want to war with anybody. But we want to keep our area safe. We want to keep our trade safe. We also want the world trade to uh, flow safely. And we want to keep uh, rules-based order in the, in the Indian Ocean region. So, uh, if you compare with the USA, yesterday, the Chinese have uh, outnumbered the number of uh, warships that the US has. As, as per a recent study, I think of last year, the uh, US had about 210-odd uh, seagoing ships, warships. And uh, China today has about 235. And they're building at a very, very fast pace. It is expected that... Uh, by 2030, the Chinese forces would have uh, increased by about 50%. That means about 300, 320 odd ships they will have. And uh, where the US has an edge is that their firepower today is better. Vertical launched stations that they have, numbers of they're off, are far more than uh, that of uh, China. But even this number, this gap is also uh, fast closing in. It used to be about 200 times uh, 20 years ago. Today, it is just about three times the U.S. is larger. And it is expected that by 2028, China would have more number of vertically launched systems on their warships than the uh, U.S. would have. Well, I will say that India certainly does not need to match uh, China because for the simple reason that we have uh, we don't have uh, expeditionary or, or far-distance roles, for that matter, to uh, be able to look after the IOR. We will need to expand our uh, naval capacity number of ships, we are already looking at about a 200 or 200 number Navy uh, by about 2035. We are looking at uh, a 450 aircraft Navy by about 2032. And uh, number of submarines also is going up accordingly. Uh, as you are aware, recently we had in the news that the second uh, nuclear capable nuclear vessel, uh, Arighat, is about to be commissioned. I think there are plans to have more of these. And uh, infrastructure-wise, also, uh, our, our shore base infrastructure on the mainland is uh, quite sufficient, though it is being enhanced uh, to meet future requirements. Uh, and the Andaman and Nicobar Island, also, we have uh, our Navy as plans, and government has plans to expand those places. I'm glad you mentioned the Arighat, because uh, there has been speculation ever since... Uh... Prime Minister Narendra Modi sent those jets across the line of actual control uh, after the Pulwama attack. And, uh, you know, uh, there has been, uh, you know, many people saw that as, in a sense, India testing out its second strike capability. We had the Arihant at that time. Now we have the Arighat. Uh, some people believe, Admiral, that essentially India needs about four nuclear submarines, which are some of the most complicated things to build uh, in the world. But about four should be should give us enough deterrence. Do you agree with that opinion that we need, essentially, we need two more? Uh, good question. And also, you are aware that after our uh, no first use policy, which was articulated uh, almost about two decades back, India had set upon uh, setting up uh, nuclear vectors on land. Uh, through air and uh, from the sea. So we are quite well uh, placed as far as our uh, land-based uh, vectors are concerned as also what can be launched from uh, our Air Force platforms. Uh, Arihant was the submarine which was commissioned uh, four or five years ago. And uh, happy to say that the second one is about to be commissioned now. Uh, 
uh, these these weapons are weapons of stealth and in case of uh, any hitch or a glitch in the command and control or not being able to launch the land vectors or the air vectors these vessels uh, will come in handy uh, to be able to give a second strike which will be a telling strike in case the enemy or the adversary decides to attack them so uh, yes there has been felt uh, needs to have uh, at least four to six submarines but i am glad uh, i think there are plans to uh, at least sanction two more in quick time then of course that would take more time to materialize and uh, be ready at sea to see four to five years perhaps from now uh, but that is the order of the day Let's now come to another question that's been really in the news a lot. Uh, and this is in context to all that we have discussed so far in our conversation, Admiral. India's plans to really buffer up uh, the greater Nicobar Island area uh, to really, you know, in a manner that it has never done before and to really make use of its strategic advantages in the Bay of Bengal. How do you see India's plans of the kind of development that is coming up as far as plans show uh, in the greater Nicobar Island region. But in question again, Hindol, uh, Andaman Nicobar uh, are a very strategic uh, uh, assets for India. Not only they provide a buffer to us on the east, but they also provide uh, bases to be able to carry out surveillance keep those uh, waters, those areas under surveillance and also be able to mount uh, attack if required. So uh, a lot of efforts are being exerted to bring up these islands. I am happy to share with you that uh, in this chain of islands from north to south, which is about 700 nautical miles, there are four air stations, three of which are uh, Naval Air Station, and there's one Air Force Station. Uh, the north, northernmost, that is Diglipur, and uh, the southernmost, which is at Campbell Bay, are being upgraded to also operate our high-performance fighters from these areas, uh, which will, of course, give and enhance the reach of the fighters to operate longer distances. The uh, ports at... Uh, Campbell Bay, Utkrosh, uh, that is the Port Blair, and also Diglipur are being developed in a great manner to be able to keep and operate, uh, base and operate more ships in these areas. One also wants to know whether uh, this entire development that's happening in the Greater Nicobar Islands, how does it respond to the kind of Chinese moves you have seen, for instance, on Coco Island? So our response uh, of, uh, of developing the infrastructure and enhancing the military capability, uh, be it the Army, the Air Force and the Navy, in the Tri-Service Command of Andaman and Nicobar, is uh, very much in keeping with what we have observed uh, in the Coco Islands in the north and uh, what we expect uh, the excursions of China to come into the Indian Ocean region. I think it's very much in keeping And I'm really glad you mentioned that because this comes to, this brings me to my final question to you, Admiral, about the Andaman and Nicobar Command or the ANC as it's called. Uh, for a long, long time, the Bay of Bengal, you know, really was an area where the ANC had primacy. You know, it was the main defining force of those waters. And now, considering what is happening in Bangladesh, including, uh, you know, the erstwhile Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's allowing the Chinese to construct something called BNS Sheikh Hasina, uh, and some people believe uh, that, you know, the Americans responded to that, wanted St. Martin's Island and so on and so forth. Considering all that that's happening, uh, Coco Island on one side, BNS Sheikh Hasina on the other, how do you see the ANC, the Andaman and Nicobar Command, responding uh, to all of this uh, in, in, the, in waters that where it had primacy for the longest time in history? So whilst uh, Andaman and Nicobar Island, you rightly said, were isolated and uh, rather invulnerable 
because of their far distances and from the from the foreign shores. Uh, the the presence of Chinese ships, the Chinese uh, militia fishing vessels in these re in this in this region has also uh, encouraged our nation uh, to develop Andaman Nicobar and enhance its capabilities in terms of the kind of aircraft which can operate from there, including fighters, our uh, more capable uh, ships which have to punch to operate from spaces for longer times. And also, as I mentioned earlier, also develop the air stations. Now, this new angle of St. Martin Island, uh, which you just mentioned. Now, this is an island which is very close to Chittagong. And uh, irrespective of what the media may today say, as somebody was trying to stake claim to that, I only wish to say that uh, this, this island is a very small island of about three kilometers long and uh, 400 to 500 meters wide, but it is uh, more or less on a straight line. And uh, anybody would see that uh, uh, a strip can easily be developed on this aircraft, which could be about uh, two and a half to 3,000 uh, uh, meters long, which is sufficient for fighters to operate. And uh, small, small areas of this island could also have jetties where the warships could be berthed. Interesting thing is that this is just about uh, eight kilometers from uh, the nearest coast, that is Myanmar. And uh, perhaps about uh, you know, three, uh, 30 or 40 miles from uh, Bangladesh. So uh, being that close to, to, to two foreign countries, somebody would want to have their uh, naval base or air base there, uh, poses questions. But uh, when it comes to feasibility, it certainly can be made, I, I dare say. Even at the cost of uh, spoiling and uh, and uh, you know killing the ecology, which these are coral islands. But uh, having seen what uh, China has done with the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, it's not very difficult for anyone to make uh, and claim this island to make a military base. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral. Fascinating and very incisive comments on some of the most important things and issues hogging headlines at the moment. Uh, Red Admiral Mukul Astana, thanks very much for your time and taking us through these complex issues uh, that are playing out in our region. No doubt we will have many opportunities in future to discuss these things as they progress uh, with you in detail. Once again, thanks very much for your time. Indol, thank you so much. Pleasure to have been with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.